Thank you, Mrs. Russ. Good evening. So I'm not going to go through every slide. Um, I'm just going to give a nutshell version so that we are not here all night. And so I want to start with enrollment trends and, and do want to share with you that there was a decrease of 23 um, K through five elementary students district-wide between September and January 14th. Um, and keep in mind that as we talk about a decrease in enrollment, we are down about 50% of um, the number we typically see in kindergarten. Uh, parents chose to um, keep their students home one more year under the circumstances. Um, and so a, a decrease of 170 students um, in secondary from September 2020 to January of 2021. And so um, as a result of those um, that withdrew, those 193 students, 143 of those students withdrew between December and January. And we were really curious how many of those students um, went to nearby towns um, in Texas where they were receiving in-person learning. And so it was just very interesting that um, nine of the 193 were graduates, which is awesome. Um, 58 moved out of state, but only 11 students moved out of state within 100 miles. Um, and so uh, that was interesting for us that um, only 11 um, moved nearby and then um, five students moved to nearby um, districts in New Mexico. Um, 50 students were disenrolled for non-attendance um, and we have since re-enrolled many of those students. During that same time frame uh, between December and, and January 14th, um, we enrolled 95 students and 13 of those were re-enrollments. So trying to regain those students that um, had disconnected or had not been involved and get them re-engaged in our um, education program. We are down about 297 um, students from the 80 day count last year as compared to the 80 day count this year, which is in early December. So we are down quite a bit, but again, many of those, um, probably half of those are um, kindergarten students that we typically have in a normal in a normal year. I do wanna talk a little bit about cohort change requests. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we allowed parents to choose which cohort they wanted their student to attend. And cohort C is open at all times. If at any point, teachers, or I'm sorry, parents want to move their student to virtual only, they have that option. And that's an expectation of our public education department. Um, for a variety of reasons, parents may choose that. So um, we decided that in um, November, we allowed parents to make a change, a cohort change request for the second semester. Um, as many people had chosen cohort C and then called and asked if they could get back into cohort A or B. And we can't just do that quickly and easily. Every week, um, the um, employee services department and I meet to look at numbers and classes to make sure that we're balancing out those cohorts and that we're not overloading classes. And so that's why the change to cohort A and B is so hard. But the changes that were requested for second semester, 43 students um, were requesting to move to cohort C and 273 students requested to move to cohort A or B. Um, and that's in grades K through 12. So we, we thought that was pretty significant. The next thing I want to um, touch base about is um, assessment. And so um, one of the things that's not in your packet that we didn't have at the time we put um, the deadline came to, to put the board packet together was our local interim assessment. And so we take that at the beginning of the year and then middle of the year and at the end of the year. And it's aligned with the summative assessments that students take um, that are state required. And so because they're aligned, they're a good predictor of success. And so one of the things that uh, Mrs. Russ will be forwarding your way following the meeting is 
Um, we were really proud of our students, and this is for grades three through eight. 32 to 60% of our students are on target to being proficient in ELA, um, reading, writing, um, comprehension, all of those things, the ELA assessment. Um, unfortunately for math, our numbers were much lower and seven to 16% of our students in grades three through eight are on target to being proficient in math. And so we know we have work to do, but that provides us with an opportunity to know really where we need to drill down and look at the standards and where our kids are missing it so that we can provide an opportunity for them to accelerate. So great information and, and Lee Morris did a fantastic job of gathering that data for us. Just a little bit of information that came out last uh, week regarding assessments. So um, as you will recall, last year, the state applied for a waiver and we didn't take the end of year summative assessment that we typically take. Um, and until last week, um, we were still planning to do that this year because a waiver had not been uh, even applied for, but the PED um, is applying for a waiver for districts to not be required to take the summative assessment in the spring. They're planning for an opt-in method of assessment this year. So we don't have all the details yet, but they should be coming very soon. Our district supports um, not giving the summative assessment um, for a variety of reasons, including the opportunity to learn um, has presented many challenges for our students due to lack of internet, or they have had to take on additional responsibilities, caring for their siblings, or maybe working um, to assist their parents. Um, and, and consistent and regular direct instruction and feedback with teachers um, has not been what we've been used to traditionally. And so while our teachers are doing a fantastic job at the best that they can, um, there have been challenges under this current situation. Another reason is the benefit of taking the assessment does not outweigh the cost of the instructional time that we will have to dedicate um, to administer the assessments. As well, because the math and ELA and science assessments that were scheduled for last spring were new and due to the shutdown, um, those, those assessments were not given, therefore, um, there is no data. There are no cut scores um, for that test and there would be no student specific information or standard level data um, as a result. So simply there would not be any information that could be provided to benefit future instruction. And the fourth reason is we have several instruments in place that provide us with an understanding of where students are performing related to grade level standards, as well as how each student is growing from where he or she started at the beginning of the year. And I mentioned that with the interim assessment, but we have a, a variety of um, nine week assessments um, and, and the benchmark that I just spoke about, um, the interim assessment, those are grade level um, assessments. We also have adaptive assessments, um, iStation in K through five for ELA and math. And then our special education students um, use Pathblazer and MyPath um, so that we can see where, they're, where they are growing and where they're needing specific assistance. And our level four students use unique learning systems and that is aligned to essential elements that are standards for the functional curriculum. And so I just wanted to share that information with you because we know that assessment can sometimes be um, a tricky topic and we are, um, we are supporting a waiver and doing an opt-in and, and finding out what that means for parents that are interested in opting in their student um, for assessment. We will continue to give the SAT at the high school um, that is, the assessment for high school and we also know that many students need that for um, college opportunities. So I think that does it for assessments and the last thing I want to talk about tonight is student engagement and our, our teachers have done a phenomenal job of 
learning quickly in the last 10 months um, how to engage students in their learning. And we have done a tremendous amount of research, um, professional development of how to engage students. And yet we know that some students are still not engaged. And so um, for students without internet access, um, we the schools provide packets for the students. And then as students complete that work, they turn it in and they get a new packet for the next year. <coughs> also another um, Engage New Mexico is a tier three intervention provided by the public education department for students that are not attending. And so they have coaches that reach out to our um, students. Um, I will share with you though, before a student gets to a tier three intervention, teachers, um, attendance success coaches, principals, um, a variety of people have reached out our family services department. So we, we have truly exhausted every opportunity that we know prior to um, asking for Engage New Mexico to assist us. And the last thing that I just want to touch on, and I know that Dr. Norris will talk more about our social emotional learning subs that have been hired, but every building has at least one. And they really help students, help schools with assisting students, whether it's um, the students not attending or they're not turning their work in or they're having difficulty with their technology, a variety of issues. Um, our social emotional subs that we were able to hire um, have been a true and a tremendous asset to our schools in reaching out to families and being that connection. And I think that does it for my update. It's a little longer than two minutes and I apologize, but needed to share that. And there's some, tr some tremendous information from our principals. Thank you, Ms. Russ and, and board. Uh, it is an honor to get to share with you the elementary performance. So in a nutshell, we have an update. We're gonna to try to answer where do we need to be now? Uh, where are we now and what is the plan? So first, uh, first we need to find intermediate, immediate, reliable and individual results for math and reading. And so we got a nationally normed I-Station assessment. Of course, it's pre-COVID and um, it's pretty ambitious for the scores that we need to have. Next, all right, this is an example of the I-Station prescribed monthly goals and level four is considered on grade level. So we use these to uh, address where each kid needs to be. We created charts for math and reading to track the progress uh, from October to December. All right, so why October? We selected October to rule out any potential testing discrepancies that were identified during August and September. Uh, this is also gave us an opportunity to solidify our procedures and protocols such as proctoring the exams. Every teacher in the district has the ability to drill down, next slide please, uh, to drill down to the individual student and address the individual interventions and acceleration needs of every child in, in Clovis schools. So this is an example of the reports that the teachers can see. And hit the next slide. This is our reading report. The blue represents the uh, recommended uh, level four and the red represents the district's actual performance. So we were able to uh, assess where we were with each individual grade level. So this is kindergarten, first through fifth. And as you can see, we're growing parallel right alongside the ambitious goals of iStation. All right, so our one big takeaway is that our elementary students are growing. Um, we are not where we need to be exactly, but we are pushing forward. We, how do we move from here to there? One of the ways that we're gonna do that, next slide, is that we're gonna have goals for math and reading for iStation that we've prescribed for every teacher for every grade level. And then we're also gonna utilize our partnerships, our mentorships, our SEL subs, and we're gonna align our resources. Uh, next slide, because ultimately we are stronger, better together. And that is the elementary report.
Good evening, board, Ms. Russ. Thank you for the opportunity to represent our middle schools. Um, I'm going to begin by looking at our benchmark assessment data. That's what we utilize at middle school. We will take um, midterms and I make assessments. And I really wanted to look at a comparison from last year's midterm and nine week assessment to this year's. And of course, it's all fall semester of 2019 and fall semester of 2020. As you look in the gray, I just kind of want to touch on a few things. That is 2019. And you can see overwhelmingly that majority of this year we have decreased in um, most areas. However, there are some anomalies. If you look at the green areas, those are where we have actually um, tested higher this year than we did last year. Um, really, to attribute that to anything, my thought process is, is that we were really focusing on power standards this year because we did not want to overwhelm students with extra standards. We just really wanted to focus and hone in on the key um, standards. So that could be one, one reason. It also could be um, due to the amount of students who did test versus who did not test. As you can also see specifically Algebra 1, um, our students aren't struggling too much there. They're doing okay. And so um, that is a, a, good, a good sign. Um, if you can go ahead and look over to the first semester absences, this, this is really interesting. We've had to make um, just a few shifts this year in middle school and how we conducted our virtual learning. And so with that being said, it really did impact attendance and we utilized um, a couple of different platforms and ways to take attendance until we finally all came in live um, at and ran on the same exact schedule. So what this attendance shows us is that um, basically what, what it is is it's absences for every class period, every day, every week. And so we did it weekly. And if you see the item in red, November 2nd, this was right when we shifted over to our live um, in um, live teaching. And that was our highest attendance or absence rate. And really we were looking at, it took a couple of weeks for students to settle into the new model. Also, um, we were finally taking attendance exactly the same where students were in class and teachers, they saw them, that's how they were, you know, that's how they um, were marked for their attendance. But you can see after that each week, it has, the attendance um, absence rate has decreased. And then right now, currently, um, since we've begun school this semester, um, the schools are 80% higher in um, student attendance, which, um, the kids were ready to come back. So um, that was exciting and, and we're, we're still progressing. And then I just wanted to give some data in regards to what Ms. Estes said regarding um, our, our no internet. I wanted to give you the raw numbers and for middle school, we had um, 75 students overall in the fall semester who did not have internet and we were able to decrease that to 36 by um, the means of, of um, items that the city provided and um, so we're, we're proud that that was able to decrease, but also um, just wanted to reiterate to that those students do receive paper packets as a form um, of, of their education. It's not the best, but that's what we're providing at this point. So really just some of the takeaways, I wanted to share that um, overall in middle schools, we are still continuing and pursuing many of the items that we have plotted for from UVA. We continue to still practice capturing kids' hearts um, in the classroom as well as building level. We have staff social contracts. Um, we continue to have data meetings, which was another press that we did not want to give up. We do have monthly PLCs. I will share um, that we have done, as the middle schools um, have done a really great job at having our teachers work together. They um, actually district-wide. So, a sixth grade science teacher, our sixth grade science teachers, they meet weekly just to lesson plan. And it's not building level, it's district level. So that is something that we've been able to build over the last few years. And we were continuing to be, to be able to utilize that in this platform. And we're very proud of that because they're looking at each other's data, they're planning together. And um, our students across the district, if they're mobile, they're getting the same from school to school. So um, just wanted to touch on that highlight. Also, one area that we were really concerned about when we closed down in March was um, the skills that the students would be losing. So 
On Wednesdays, um, when the students are given SEL lessons, we also at the middle school um, have have platforms that we have our students work on to close the gaps that they may have or even accelerate those students who are doing well and need to be pushed further. And currently at Gaddis, we, we are utilizing Edmentum, um, Marshall is utilizing IXL, and um, Yucca is utilizing MobyMax. So that's just an extra platform that helps students build on skills. Um, I, I just want to finish with, I think what we have learned overall is when something isn't working, change it. And we really have done um, a good job at looking and shifting and and um, and just assessing what we're doing and changing it as necessary. And when we finished the semester, we really did, um, the kids were doing really good and our teachers are doing really great with um, online teaching and, and strategies that they're using. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak on behalf of the middle schools. Thank you, Ms. Mendoza. And I just want to take a minute to um, offer this reminder. Last week, we shared this information with a group of parents. And at the end of the meeting, one of the parents said, I don't know what you all did between spring to fall, but things are just clicking and my student is moving. And I think that many of us maybe had forgotten that we were directed by the public education department when we closed in March, not to introduce any new standards. And so to be seeing some upward trajectory, um, we're glad to see that having forfeited really any new learning in the fourth quarter of last year. We don't deny that there is ground to gain, but I think that it um, is very important to keep that within that context of how very much we were limited. Um, and when our campus staff received the green light to start pressing ahead, they have truly been working to, to press ahead. Um, thank you, Ms. Mendoza, again. And uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Jay Brady from the perspective of our um, high school grade level. Thank you, Ms. Russ, members of the board. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, share some informa information with you from the first semester with our nine through 12 uh, student clusters. So I wanna start by saying that um, my interactions with our teachers, nine through 12, and, and I really wanna drive this point home. Our teachers are amazing and they're heroes. They are ordinary everyday heroes that are holding the rope and hauling the water and doing the impossible uh, in trying to maintain a quality education for kids in public schools. And when you walk away from the data sets that we have and we start talking about the things that they've had to grapple with to keep kids focused, engaged, and moving forward towards graduation, because everything 9 through 12 is moving towards that graduation date on the horizon, uh, I want to make sure that our teachers in this district are recognized for their everyday efforts. It's nothing more than humbling and underappreciated. And I really want to emphasize, uh, I really believe in them and they are our heroes. So uh, I'm going to briefly go through Mr. Howell's data from the freshman campus. And, and miraculously enough, uh, the high school's data will mirror this. Uh, if you'll look in your columns, you'll see the core content areas, which is what we track. Uh, we published a dashboard at the high school. This is Mr. Uh, Howe's dashboard for the freshman campus. And I would like you to look at the end of the, the pass rate for the end of the first nine weeks and the end of the second nine week periods. That's that third and fourth column. And then passed with credit. That means these kids maintained and stayed on track to graduation uh, through their first semester of virtual learning as freshmen at the high school level. So ELA 1, obviously 71%, 100% of our kids in honors ELA. Biology, 87%, U.S. History, 78%, Algebra 1, 71%, and then our pre-AP Algebra 1 students, which are on an accelerated track, 95%. And then you can look at your electives, 84 and 89% respectively. And then we track attendance because if they're not in class, they can't learn. And so uh, when you look at our first and second nine weeks uh, attendance, uh, did a really good job of keeping kids in the high 80s and 90s. 
of getting them there. Uh, and so I will tell you there was a downward declination if you'll look at that at the second nine weeks. Uh, and that is pretty indicative of what was going on at the high school. So let's move to the high school slide, please. So if you can uh, hopefully blow that up just a little bit for me, Cindy KK, thank you. So as you can see, lots of different contents in the four core disciplines. I will not uh, go through each number, but I wanna make sure that you go past with credit at the end of each one of those columns. There is a number in uh, parentheses there. Those are the number of students that we will be uh, having to recycle uh, and they'll be retaking classes for credit. They did not pass with a score that would give them credit. Now, math being the most difficult will have the most kids, but when you look at the pass rates from the number of students that are enrolled in our core content areas, this is at or above average right now with what we track in a normal brick and mortar setting. And I'm gonna go back to the heroes that I'm talking about in looking at those pass rates and the number of kids that we're gonna recycle, we will do that in zero hour ingenuity classes, ingenuity classes during the day, after school ingenuity classes, as well as night school opportunities. And so these kids can recover credit fairly rapidly, having been in the content, if it wasn't an attendance issue that caused the failure, these kids should be able to accelerate. And if they'll stay after it, they can get a credit before the end of the semester fairly quickly and hopefully complete with success. And then I wanna uh, tout the uh, attendance rate right now. When you look at it, our attendance rate, first nine weeks, 89%, we went down to 70, we're moving 78% second nine weeks for an average of an 84 daily, 84% uh, daily attendance rate. And then you can see our pass rates holistically for all the different core content areas, math, science, social studies, and English down in the bottom left-hand uh, boxes. And when you think about a 72% pass rate for our math, which is algebra one, or algebra two, geometry, stats, which is an AP class, pre-calc, uh, pre-AP geometry, and then calculus AB and calculus BC, it's kind of a role of that. We have a 72% pass rate in a virtual only setting. Science, that would be our um, chemistry is their entry level. When you think about uh, physics being the next one, and then they can go on to some other sciences, uh, a nice pass rate there of 88%. And then when you think about social sciences, 81% pass rate, and then our English language arts teachers, getting kids to read and write, very challenging. And I want you to know I'm very proud of their work, 88%. So that's the data to show the numbers of kids that when you have 1,500 kids on campus and you think about, uh, you know, more than two thirds of your kids are on track in the pandemic reality that we're living in towards credit, making credit towards graduation, it's those teachers, folks. and and. Members of the board, I want to make sure that I that I say that over and over again. Now, we talk about what the teachers have been engaged in doing, and this is where I'm going to spend a little time. Continued uh, professional development, ongoing professional development. Our math teachers have been working with a math special, specialist, and they have been working on developing social presence, teacher presence that leads to cognitive presence. A lot of research behind that, but they've had ongoing uh, professional development, trying to really impact student learners and engage them at high levels in high levels of thinking and application in virtual. And so that was well spent time in that professional development. And then we went with the distance learning playbook that Mrs. Russ gave us. And Annetta Hadley, my instructional coach and I attended some training with that. And then Annetta came back and, and I partnered with her, but she was the, the war horse in that. She gave quality professional development that laid out five strategies that our people could really utilize across all contents to ramp up engagement and participation. Uh, we've continued with our NIPSI training for our AP teachers. So there's been ongoing professional development and there will be more professional development for those AP teachers. Uh, we partnered with uh, our federal programs and Laura Atkins, who's done an amazing job of delivering uh, professional development to elevate the performance of our L students. But what's good for L students is good for every kid. And so we've been doing Clavis training. We just finished uh, an audit with our English language arts teachers and the people that are on the outside, the evaluators that come in that are working with us, we're really complimentary of what our people do to engage our kids and to really make what they're learning uh, appreciable and then also applicable and keep kids highly engaged in the lessons. And so kudos and shout outs to our English language arts teachers, very proud of that. Um, our NIPSI partnership has yielded some, we looked at a model and we're trying to think about how we can 
keep kids engaged and how we can make it doable. So whether they're face-to-face -face or they're uh, virtual still, how do we get kids in a class and we are able to deliver them, deliver them quality information and engage them in a meaningful way that they can participate and get what they need from the course. So we asked for $45,000 and they gave us $45,000 from that partnership. That's our National Math and Science Initiative. And we bought a camera system, it's called Poly Studio, that we're piloting. It's not just a camera system that's gonna make the difference. It's quality instruction with great standards that we're focusing on, integrated technology, and then high yield engagement strategies as a blend of what we're going to hopefully put together with a target group of teachers to develop a model that it won't matter if they're in the classroom or if they're virtual, if they're there, we can engage them and we can keep them motivated and going. And that has a lot of application moving past pandemic. So our NIPSI partnership uh, really rewarded us and they've invested in us and they've asked Clovis High School to serve as mentors and models. And then we'd also be that outside resource of this is what we're thinking, this is what we're doing with NIPSI schools across the nation. We've, uh, we've given our okay for them to reach out if they would like some assistance and where we're trying to go on this journey. Um, we will be adding environmental science, another AP class this next year. We will be moving AP biology down to the freshman campus so a freshman level student can be in an AP class uh, at the freshman uh, level. And we're very happy about that. And we're about to uh, go uh, online and, and, and really hit it hard with our Saturday study sessions. And so those are about to fire up where we have those outside experts, those NIPSI teachers that have been doing it for a while. They come in and they work with our, uh, our kids on those AP exams, which I'm going to plug this. I'm proud of my district. Uh, with NIPSI and our district, we pay for every AP test that those kids take. That's still on tap. Our kids will still get the study sessions that help prep them for AP exams, which could lead to college credit, which is universally accepted. So I'm excited about that continuing. Uh, I'm gonna shout out for Melissa Wynn at our early college high school, but she's all, also our Carl Perkins director. That's that CTE group. The PED was just here and did a CTE audit with our kids. Uh, and with our teachers. And they looked at our programs of study. They looked at the training that's applied, what we're doing to engage our kids, the, the quality of the environment, the access to resources. And I'm gonna tell you something, Melissa Wynn could be running the CTE program at the state. And they had raving remarks for what we have for programs of study for our kids. But I'm gonna give this comment to you that they gave that was probably the most powerful for me. They reiterated this several times as they interviewed our staff our staff demonstrated that they are all in and they will do whatever it takes to help a kid. That their hearts and their minds, and whatever it takes to engage a student, they're there. And that resonated in that audit. And when you get that kind of feedback, I wanna make sure that the CTE teachers and Mrs. Wynn uh, really get that. But you know, that's every teacher at Clovis High School right now. I can't be more proud of my people. So early college high school, uh, they have hired subs. We have a strong enrollment going out there. I'm gonna say it's right around 150-ish. It's varied a little bit, but Melissa Wynn's got kids that are out there in programs of study. They stand ready to go back and re-enter with the high school classes as well as some of the college classes. The kids that were in project-based classes have been allowed to go. So if they were in a shop or a, or a, a, a medical uh, uh, program of study, they've been allowed to go to some of those classes. I won't speak to all the specifics of that, but we have had early college kids out there, but we're, we're set and staged and ready to go back to a return and get them back there. But the support, the wraparound support for those kids and the resources that that partnership with CCC, uh, I want to commend Mrs. Wynn and Robin Kirkendall and Miss Estes and the union there because they really have driven a vision and those kids that are in that model are going to be they're highly successful and they're going to graduate with that associates as well as that high school uh, degree and, and they're advancing very well with a lot of support and that's because they're, they're keeping their eye on the ball there uh, our sel subs i want to thank the district for listening to taking that one thing off the plate and helping our teachers uh, manage everything that we're asking from them and virtual only the management of everything that we do is just hard and it's time consumptive and there aren't enough hours in the day. So cabinet, Mrs. Russ heard that, brought those SEL subs, which Mrs. Uh, Dr. Norris will bring in some information on, but they're doing their job. I want you to know that it's not that they brought it, they're calling and the information that they're giving, well, 
it's kind of overwhelming. And when you think about 1500 kids in a school and the volume of information they're getting, you know, just so you know, this is what's going on with this kid or this family. Our APs and our counselors at this high school have responded to the challenge and what they've done to wrap around and support kids and families and to keep them going to school while they're living through crisis, they need to be acknowledged for the heavy lifting that they're doing to support families and the community. So our APs and our guidance counselors are truly an invaluable part of the team of what we're doing to motivate and drive towards that graduation. Pod workouts are still going. Mr. Baca, Coach Baca will give you an update on what's going on with that. But I want to talk about our coaches and the fact that they've kept hope going. Our high school coaches across the board and every and every opportunity we have to participate and to compete, those coaches have been the driving forces in keeping their teams going and keeping them motivated to that future point in time for participation. And we have one now. So out of boys and out of girls for our coaches. I'm extremely proud of the time they've been doing those pod workouts. They've lived with every rule. They've set the model. Coach Baca said, this is what we got to do. And those people went out there and they put the standard for others to follow. And I'm, I'm real proud of what they've done there. Uh, I want to say something about another opportunity. We've got a partnership with uh, uh, CCC again in the form of a USDA grant. We're looking at implementing a new program of study that's wrapped around horticulture. I want to say thank you to Dr. Kirkendall as well as uh, Mrs. Estes for bringing that. But Diego Dow and Malia Blackburn are two ag teachers that are going to put that in. It'll lead, it'll, it, kids can work through the course requirements. They'll end up with a cert, which can lead on into a, an industry demand uh, for uh, agriculture and greenhouse uh, and, and greenhouse production. So we're really happy about that. Hopefully we can get that worked out, but we're in the process, the beginning stages of doing that. Some of the challenges, I wanna make sure you get that. Thank God we're coming back because that's been one of my big crosses to bear. I don't know how you can be in a CTE class when you're supposed to be learning how to weld and learn to weld meaningfully if you never have a stick in your hand learning to weld. And so I wanna commend our CTE teachers again for what they've done to make sure they taught shop safety and the equipment specs and what kids needed to do to be ready to go in the shop. And I can guarantee you those labs, those shops, those kitchens, those places where kids go in and get to do the projects, they're gonna be on fire and up and running when we get to return with our kids. So we're really excited about that uh, amazing stuff there. And then the last thing I will say is we've grappled and I know I've gone over my two minutes, but I think at the high school level, when you think about how to press and relief, release with what we're asking kids to do, our kids are still getting a quality education. They're getting one that'll prepare them. A credit will mean something when we get through this. The, the diploma we give them will have value because it still has Clovis High School on it, which re represents the community of Clovis. And we know that we're doing our very best to prepare our kids for that workforce or that military experience or that college experience. And I'm gonna again go back and I'm gonna finish by saying, God bless our teachers. Thank you for everything that you've done through pandemic to get us here. We've got a lot of changing to do and they're up for it and they're gonna make us proud over and over again. Thank you board, thank you Mrs. Russ. I assure you, board, that our remaining updates are going to go more quickly, but at the same time, without us sharing this information, it's very difficult for you and for our public to really know what's going on behind the scenes because it's not visible and obvious. And so I appreciate your indulgence in um, our pretty lengthy updates that were related to academic services and we'll do our best to push through these that remain. Um, one of the departments that immediately had to go through an evolution in March was our ancillary services and our services for all of our students with disabilities and so I've asked um, Mrs. Hancock and Mrs. Woodard to join together just to give a brief update of, of how we've continued to provide these services. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Russ and board. Um, thank you for letting us have just a few moments to kind of talk about what is happening over at Student Support. Um, we did not include graphs and charts uh, specifically with our kiddos because our kiddos are part of what you just saw as far as 
um, how things are going with academic performance and attendance. Our people are um, working diligently with kids to provide those specifically designed instruction so that they can, in fact, the students can, in fact, um, be able to make the, the academic progress. And so we currently um, have 1,308 kiddos on IEPs who are students with disabilities. And we have 390 um, students on IEPs who are gifted services. Um, I am very excited to say that we have not missed a beat. We did not uh, miss providing services to students with disabilities or students who are receiving gifted services. When school started this year, we were very fortunate um, and were able to take back uh, our students with disabilities into the schools with, with some certain criteria. And when we started back, we had approximately a little more than half of our students on IEPs whose families decided to have them come um, at least one day a week. We had some different models set up for secondary schools and, and elementary schools, but our teachers have been receiving students and students have been receiving some in-person instruction. Um, at the elementary schools, the kiddos are coming uh, in the hybrid model and have been in their classrooms two days and then have been working with special education teachers for two days. While the kids are in school, uh, our ancillary providers have continued to provide quality ancillary services um, in speech, OT, PT, mental health. Um, I have a teacher for the visually impaired who's also working with kids as well as the audiologist. Uh, they have been true rock stars because they have um, they have been folks that the ancillary providers have been folks who have had to provide services in person and virtually and maybe this 30 minutes was in person and the next 30 minutes was virtually and they have certainly risen to the challenge to be able to provide those good quality services so that the kiddos are getting what they need. Um, I have also in my department eight diagnosticians and they are my primary evaluators. Um, we are, uh, we have <laughs> really had some challenge in evaluating uh, kids to determine whether or not they're kids who are gifted or kids with disabilities. Um, but the, again, those ancillary providers, including the Diags, have really met, met that challenge. They are doing some combination of online, um, online assessments. They're doing in-person assessments when they can. Uh, we've really used a good triangulation of data model and are considering data from previous years um, so that we are not uh, taking a chance of calling a child a child with a disability based on criteria or based on data that we've collected from this this crazy year that we've been in. So our, our folks are continuing to move right along with, with the evaluation process. Like I said, teachers are in school providing in-person services to kiddos who are wanting in-person ser services. And then I have teachers as well who are providing <laughs> online services or virtual services for students on IEPs as well so that we haven't missed one thing. Um, one other group that I wanted to be sure and recognize in my department are the nurses. Um, with my ancillary pro providers and my teachers and my students with disabilities, the nurses have also been on campuses this whole time. We this year are very lucky to have 19 positions that leaves one nurse at every school plus two at CHS and so they've been there working really, really hard making sure the COVID protocols are followed and that our kids and set staff are as safe as possible. So I did want to give them a shout out as well. Um, we are, like Mitzi said, uh, looking, uh, using PathLaser in my path so that we are providing targeted interventions and we do have some uh, benchmark assessments along the way so that we can document student growth since testing isn't, isn't going to be taking place. Uh, and I concur with Mr. Brady, the teachers and my ancillary providers in my department are the rock stars and deserve deserve true recognition for the things that they've done. They've they've built a plane while it was flying, and and as you can see from the attendance and academics um, report, uh, our kids are making growth, and our students with disabilities are included in those numbers. So I am am very pleased to report that. We have, uh, have services going on and we're just gonna continue to meet kids at where they're at and provide them with the services uh, that they need according to their IEPs. Thank you that's, so much. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. And moving on, um, the requirement that our schools have had to answer to to continue with their 90 day strategic planning has continued in spite of having to basically relearn 
and reinvent school. And Ms. Carrie Nigerville oversees that process for our district and has some brief updates for you with regard to that process. Thank you, Ms. Russ, and good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, all of our schools are required to submit 90-day plans, both in the fall and in the spring. Uh, the fall process is a little more engaged because they're going through a very deep data dive. They're identifying root causes of the issues that they're seeing and then preparing a plan. Um, and the spring is a very similar process, but often they're continuing the work that was started in the fall. And so the document that was shared with you identifies the focus areas and the desired outcomes of each of our school plans. Um, you've heard already what a, an incredible job that our teachers are doing and our, our service providers, uh, but I also want to really give some kudos to our principals because they have not let up in the push for improving the work that they're doing and improving outcomes for kids. And, and none of them have taken the position that we have enough going on just trying to get through the day. We don't need to have a 90 day plan that really pushes us even further. Instead, they have really taken to the challenge. Nearly half of our schools have a focus somewhere on virtual engagement because they really see the need to improve not not only the experience for kids, but ensure that kids are exposed to rigorous instruction and they're held accountable for rigorous response. Um, we also have about 50% of our schools that are engaging in the DDI process with weekly data meetings. And so they are jumping in to make sure that teachers have an effective protocol and process to follow for effective planning and then using data from their student assessments to plan for instruction. So just kudos uh, to all of our school teams. And I leave you with that for a 90 day update. Thank you so much, Mrs. Nigerville. Um, as you know, we've received some additional federal dollars and um, we have, or I should say, Ms. Laura Adkins um, has gone through the process to revise how we use those, those dollars to meet the needs that we've seen. One of those great needs was to provide those SEL subs. And so I've asked Ms. Laura Adkins to give you an update specific to our use of our um, uh, federal dollars. CARES Act. Good afternoon or evening. Um, the district participated in two CARES grants um, through the state that the federal money passed down through the state. And the first grant was the CARES Act that we applied for in May. It was 1.9 million. And I've given you a summary briefly of what we've spent those funds on uh, to date. Uh, we are encumbering most of our funds to uh, do replacement laptops and to support those principals initiatives to either at the secondary level uh, help support credit recovery, enrichment opportunities to accelerate learning, or at the elementary level, as soon as we can um, get more students on site and in the month of June plan for summer type instruction to accelerate those learning opportunities and close those learning gaps. The second CARES grant was just for internet service and 100% of that has been spent on providing services for the internet. You may be wondering why do we still have kids without internet and Mrs. Uh, Sh Shauna Russell will explain that. Uh, that is her uh, specialty in this report. So the two have worked together to provide uh, lots of safety equipment to keep our schools engaged and safe while they're on campus. Um, I also want to just take an opportunity to let you know that our family services team has still been out in, in neighborhoods and knocking on doors and really supporting the principals to finding those kiddos, getting kids re-enrolled and connected back to school. So even though we've been in a remote or hybrid setting, our family services team is still making those connections with families and my shout out goes to them as being out on the front line uh, supporting our schoolwork. Thank you, Ms. Russ. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins, and, and to your department as well. Mr. Rory. 
Mr. Borio, can you give us a, an update with regard to our fine arts programs? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Russ, members of the board and special guest Representative Crowder. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few things here and just give you uh, some updated information. We're extremely proud of our teachers and staff, as Mr. Brady said. They continue to plug away at music education uh, despite big challenges that the New Mexico PED has presented us with some of their policy changes. Um, our elementary staff continues to meet weekly. Whether we're in hybrid or remote mode, they deliver live instruction to all three cohorts of students each week. I want to give a shout out to Arts Academy and to Sarah Hennessy. Um, anybody that knows Arts Academy knows that the Nutcracker is a huge production for them and has been a tradition there for a long time. And they figured out a way to, to get it done this year. And so we just want to tell them thank you and congratulate them on a great performance. We also spent a large chunk of our elementary fine arts funding this year uh, buying visual art supplies. Every elementary student in the district received an own individual packet of art supplies so that they could do art lessons throughout the year and not have to share supplies and worry about COVID practices. Um, so our elementary teachers have been doing live art lessons with um, every student across the district uh, since the second nine weeks. Right now, our elementary music teachers and our elementary art teachers are actually working collaborati collaboratively on a project um, centered around the idea of Ubuntu, which is an African word that means I am because we all are. And so just focusing on this idea that we are a community and despite the setbacks that we've been placed in, that we can still come together and create something beautiful. We're also continuing our CCC culture arts series. The fifth graders were able to experience the Delbert uh, Anderson Trio last fall. And then uh, tonight, actually, the Take Three uh, String Trio is gonna perform, and we will have a performance of that for our students to share next week. In secondary music, we're still continuing to offer uh, the best instruction we can while students are at home. Those teachers meet weekly as well and continue to plan and create lessons. We were able to share the high school choir performance with you right before the end of the Christmas break, which again is something traditional for them. So trying to keep tradition alive in these weird times. The band production of their custom show, Purple a la Turk, is in the middle of being edited and should be out uh, in the next couple weeks. Uh, as Ms. Russ stated earlier, the biggest challenge we face, especially in moving into hybrid, is the PED still has a no in-person singing or instrument playing policy um, written into the guidelines. And so we are fighting that from the NMMEA. Uh, we have also uh, had the fortunate support of Mr. Baca and Ms. Russ. They were able to include that in their letter and in their appeal to the PED this last week. So we feel very supported locally and there's good support across the state. We just have to get the PED to listen to us and, and help them to realize that we have what we need in place in order to let students come to a performance-based class and actually perform. So we appreciate your support. Thanks, board. Thank you so much, Mr. Borio. And we are music in Clovis, aren't we? Um, and I know no one's all that interested in athletics, but we've we've decided <laughs> to invite Mr. Balka to give us an update as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Russ. So first of all, let, let, let me express my gratitude and, and thankfulness to this school board and, and to the school administration and the public schools for your support for athletics. You know, uh, it, it, it can't happen without that support and, and our success definitely was connected to your support. So, so thank you very much for that. So I wanna back up all the way to the month of June when we were told by the uh, NMA and the PED uh, that we could actually begin workouts uh, with, with our kids. Of course, we were placed into restrictions, uh, pods and, and having to have uh, PPE and temperature checks and, and all of that kind of stuff, monitoring forms. <clears throat> and what ended up happening was uh, we ended up having nearly 500 students uh, participate in our athletic programs uh, starting back in June uh, up until this point. And, and that number has continued to steadily be uh, close to that 500 uh, uh, students. So, you know, Mr. Brady talked about uh, heroes. Well, our coaching staff are superheroes. You know, on top of uh, uh, their teaching responsibilities, they've also continued to to work with our kids in the athletic uh, in the athletic world as well. And and, and I am so proud of our, our coaching staff. You know, one of the challenges that I presented to them back in, in June when we first started was the one thing we're going to do because we're known uh, across New Mexico uh, as, as the toughest uh, athletic program in the state you know, our Wildcat Nation is so proud of our of our teams and, and, and we appreciate that as well from our community. But I challenged our, our coaching staff and our athletes 
to keep in mind that, you know, I don't know what day it's going to be, uh, but someday we're going to get to play again. And, and we're going to have to be ready to play. And, and unfortunately, a lot of school districts in the state of New Mexico did not allow uh, their athletes to work out uh, in pods. Uh, again, I'm thankful our district did. And so, you know, I kind of uh, felt as though as we continue to say that over and over and over again, uh, that people began to doubt that that was ever going to happen. And fortunately today, uh, we heard the great news that Ms. Russ alluded to. So as far as that's concerned, we're going to have to continue to stay in pods until at least February the 22nd, uh, at which time perhaps athletics can begin, uh, provided we do have a plan in place to uh, bring our kids back onto campus in the hybrid uh, uh, scenario. Uh, I do have a meeting with uh, the New Mexico Activities Association tomorrow to get some more uh, definitive uh, information in regard to uh, what that's going to look like as far as what the seasons are going to look like. Uh, so when sports will start, how many weeks we're going to be able to compete. Uh, will we be able to have fans in the stands or not? Uh, hopefully we'll get some of that clarification uh, in the next few days. I do want to mention though, uh, being proactive, we did purchase uh, cameras, pixel lot, what are called pixel lot cameras uh, at the beginning of the school year to install in our gym and in our uh, football stadium so that if we're not able to have fans, we'll be able to, uh, to live stream uh, our, our games uh, to people in the community uh, so that they can watch those. Uh, so I'm excited. Uh, I don't know all the answers yet, uh, but we're, we're closer than ever before uh, to being able to get our kids back uh, in our athletic programs. And again, none of this would be possible without the superheroes uh, that are our coaches and athletic staff. So thank you very much. And, and uh, I'll take any questions after we're done here if you, if you have any. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Baca. Um, and now with a quick update on where we stand with provision of internet for our students, uh, Deputy Superintendent Russell. So, so thank you, Superintendent Russ, um, members of the board. So we are currently working with Plateau for areas that are in the fiber network um, in sudden link for areas that do not have fiber uh, to provide internet into the homes of our students who do not currently have internet. One of the problems in trying to figure out the internet and to provide internet for those students is that it must be SIPA compliant, which is the Child Internet Protection Act. So all of our CMS devices are SIPA compliant, which means that, that um, um, there are areas of the internet that are blocked from access. When the internet providers install service into a household, the internet is wide open. Um, so if the student uses a personal device or home device to access the internet, they have access, full, full access to the websites. So we are working with their attorneys to draft a release. We've got um, um, uh, a draft back in into Suddenlink's hands. So it's moving just slowly. Um, to inform the parents of the possibility and the parent assumes responsibility for internet access, internet access if their kids are using a personal device. So Clovis Schools is going to pay $20 towards the student's internet bill at Plateau. And when they sign up for fiber service, they have the option of choosing a faster internet than what their base rate is. Um, but, but CMS is gonna pay the $20 if they want a faster internet, then they would pay the difference. Um, and we have agreed to do this with Plateau through the end of June. Um, at that point, the parent would be responsible for disconnecting service. For suddenly, Clovis Schools is going to pay the installation charges and the monthly service costs for six months. So if that starts in February, then it'll be through July. Um, at the end of that contract, the uh, account would automatically disconnect um, and if the parents are interested in continuing that internet, then they would have to call Suddenlink and get it installed um, under their name. Uh, Suddenlink's uh, internet will be under Clovis School's name. So to get service at Plateau, the, the, the student must live in a fiber area, sorry about that. They will take the voucher to Plateau and work with them to set up the service. Plateau will complete the service address and account number on the voucher. The voucher is brought back to um, the school who will forward it to Cheryl Forrest, who has been my right hand trying to get this internet uh, stuff going. Um, she will add the count to our Plateau spreadsheet and then we will pay those 
uh, charges every month. To get service at Suddenlink, the school secretary uh, have been working and have a have an ongoing list right now with the parent's name, their home address, a good contact number, and the student's name. Um, as soon as we sign the contract with Suddenlink, we will send them the list of these names. Suddenlink will contact those parents to gain access into the house to install the internet and the service. So uh, Suddenlink direct, will direct, directly build Clovis schools um, for six months worth of service. <laughs> And at which point, again, the service will be disconnected. And I think that's the end of my report. Thank you, Ms. Russell. And now we'll shift into a, a look that's connected to our employee services. And we'll begin with Deputy Superintendent uh, Strickland. All right, President Snyder and members of the board. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk to you. First, uh, I have a graph up that is showing the number of COVID positive cases that we've had with our employees. And if you'll notice uh, all the way from March through September, we had very little COVID activity in our area, even though we were um, in, in a pretty locked down situation. We did have a spike in October uh, with the 31 cases. And then November was the really intense month for us. We had a total of 63 cases. Um, I was expecting us to have quite another increase with Thanksgiving and, and winter holidays coming up. But actually in December, we saw a pretty good decrease and went down to just 36 cases. And right now as of today, and we only have another week or so left in January, still sitting at 33 cases. So. I'm um, encouraged by that. I know that we um, had an opportunity to have staff vaccinated last week. My wife and I got ours and um, we did really well with that. We had a total of about 300 employees that expressed interest in getting that vaccine. So I think with the declining numbers in the vaccine, hopefully we're trending in the right direction. <clears throat> if you wanna to move to the next slide, um, Cindy, if there's the employee services report, I know that we talked about the difficulty in having subs and getting subs to come in, but on the other side, Mandy Carpenter and her team have done a super good job of keeping our employees hired. And we're actually at, still at one of the best places that we've been in a long time when you look at total number of job openings. Right now, um, we have 40 openings, but if you take out the 16 of those are coaches and if you take those out because you know we're waiting to see what the governor said about uh, return to sports and then you get down to just what we would consider a basic teacher we really only have one elementary and three secondary basic teaching positions open the one elementary is actually a dual language uh, position and we already have a a, a hit for next year uh, to fill that position. And then the secondary ones are, are, are typically kind of difficult to fill. We have an ROTC, a family consumer science, and an art position. So in the last several years, this is definitely our best employee services report. One of the other benefits that we learned during this time in COVID as far as employee services go is that we've been able to work with people that have moved, even some people that have moved out of state because we have jobs that we need to have performed that can be performed remotely. And so in, in that area, we've learned how to do that and that we can do it successfully. So thank you again for giving me a couple of minutes of your time, enjoy your evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Strickland. Um, and next we have Ms. Mandy Carpenter who um, does some really great work in the district, leveraging our some of our very best teachers to uh, move initiatives across the district and she's going to share out some information of the, the work that our teacher leaders have been undertaking. Good evening, Ms. Russ and the board and all of our other guests this evening. I'm just going to share very briefly with you um, a program that we have with our teacher leaders and department leaders here in Clovis. We have 40 of the best and brightest teachers across the district. Every K through eight school has at least two teachers that participate and then our freshman academy and high school participate with their um, department leaders. And then also we have some um, representation from pre-K. 
but I bring these teacher leaders together at the beginning of every year and we um, actually have our own Google Classroom where we're sharing ideas and we're doing a book study right now on teaching in the online classroom. And the whole premise behind this group is that they are learning the most innovative strategies to go out and teach in the online environment. And then they are going back into their buildings and providing, providing professional development um, to their entire teaching staffs in little, little bite-sized chunks. Um, this also allows for some of that heavy um, burden to be taken off of that principal plate because we have amazing teachers in the district that are really truly experts in their craft and it's really great for our teachers to be able to learn from each other. This year our book study is teaching in the online classroom from Doug Lamov who is the guru of all things education right now and so we're really excited to be um, developing our virtual strategies. Next slide please. And so as a group, we've been developing this document um, as professionals, the um, CMS virtual participation methods. And so what we've learned as educators is that students still have to have activities that engage them, even if it's in the online setting. And so whether it's a speed question or a chat question or a wait question, um, these are all different strategies to use in the online environment. And so as a group, we've developed participation methods and how to implement these into each of the lessons throughout the district and then provided examples and videos. And so the leadership has then taken these back to their schools and given teachers real life tools to use in their teaching tool belt immediately to implement into a lessons to make them more um, engaging and active and um, I think this has really been a big education push, instructional push um, to have those teacher leaders out in the buildings um, advocating for these um, different participation methods. So we're excited about it. It's a great group of people and we're really leveraging um, the expertise that we have in our district and they're amazing. Thank you so much, Ms. Carpenter and board. I would encourage you to click on some of those um, links and it, it really gives you an inside view of how some of these strategies come to life in our classrooms around the district. Um, next, last but not least, we have Dr. Shelley Norris, who's going to share with you a little bit of information. Um, really proud of basically having invented this socio-emotional socio learning sub-position to fill a gap that um, our teachers and principals shared with us. And Dr. Norris has been spearheading this effort. Thank you. So good evening, Ms. Russ and board. Um, I, I know that you can tell from the slide and if you have the packet, you're probably going, is Shelly really gonna go through all seven pages? I'm not, I promise. <laughs> so I'm gonna hit the high points and we're gonna assume that you're gonna look at the logistics like pay and, and hours um, on your own packet. But I, I think at the end of the day, the illustration probably best describes this role and it's really connecting the hands, the hearts and the home. So really it's the, the school to home uh, relationship. And I think originally we decided upon putting the social emotional subs in um, each of the sites, by the way, I know it was mentioned previously in a couple of other um, uh, shared from other people we have you know depending on the size of the school uh, the, the greatest number of sel subs social emotional subs is at the high school we have six there and then each uh, elementary school uh, qualified for one so the bottom line is you know one of the things that we were really kind of posed with specifically back in the spring is quickly realized that it's really hard to keep up with all of the kids when everybody's not coming to school and, and we were having challenges reaching out to families and getting kids to log on, just oh, kind of lots of extraneous factors. And so by putting these people in place, these people are really helping not to be a substitute for the school, but to be a supplement and somebody to help reach out. Um, 
to to families and to remind them, hey, we're still having school. And there was a lot of kind of mixed messages during all of this. So um, it's, it's worked out absolutely beautifully. Um, Cindy, will you go all the way to, I think what the principals are saying, um, keep going, there you go. And I think the most, one more, you gotta go back down, sorry. Yeah, right there. So um, I think the bottom line is, here's what the principals are saying about their SEL stuff. So I, I did a survey of, of principals several weeks ago and said, you know, what what's the best thing that's happening with your subs? And I did I did provide you with those questions in the packet. But the bottom line is things like parents have an extra person with the CMS connection and they wish to vent to or talk to. Uh, we have kids who uh, haven't attended since Thanksgiving and now they're attending this week. Reaching out to students and families, second layer of communication and support for families, teacher support and collaborators. I mean, these people are being used in, in lots of varied ways to depending upon the targeted needs of the school. I, one of the things I think that was really most exciting for me um, was the fact that we're not just using these steps to, to troubleshoot, but also to, to provide some happy calls and like, you know, so maybe there's not an issue or challenge happening, but we have subs calling and saying, just wanted to let you know things, you know, checking on you all or things are going well in school. But like I said, they're not substituting for the teachers. They're just a really great supplement and, and a compliment to what's going on. So, um, all right, Cindy, if you'll scroll down kind of toward the bottom to our friend, the Mona Lisa. But there's your logistic info. So here, at the end of the day, the SL, the SEL subs are doing just this. Um, they are eliminating those empty classrooms and chairs. They are <laughs> addressing the needs of students and families in those in these unprecedented times through uncharted waters, reducing the worry, extraneous stressors and the workload of staff and families allowing everyone to sleep at night and i know that many people during this time have lost a lot of sleep developing a fruitful and meaningful relationship between the home and the school by the way we hope that that's generational it's not just like during the COVID, but like things happen and we and we hope that this is sustainable too um and then providing that additional we've got your back support in helping um uh, help can bear the, the burden and the weight during these current challenging times. So the uh, the munch picture here, so helping to really rid ourselves of those scream facial feelings and, and feelings of angst only to be um, kind of rewarded at the end with these kind of angelic looks of smiles. So anyway, that's really kind of a visual nutshell. Um, uh, all of the logistics are on your sheet. So feel free to take it home and read it all night. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Norris. Board, that concludes our very comprehensive, maybe not so brief um, update. And we'd like to stand for mm -hmm. questions that you might want to pose at this point.